Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Pia, for the introduction. Happy to be here. Happy to have my great panel with me. Looking forward to a great session. Um, and with that, we'll get straight to it. If we could um, bring the panel up. Awesome. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll start with introduction. So we'll start with Calvin, then we'll go to Reed, then we'll go to Charles. If you could quickly give us an introduction of who you are, where you are, so, um, your work quickly, and then uh, if you could share a little bit about your family, either your immediate family or the community that you consider your family. All right, thanks, Wesley. Good morning, everybody. Calvin Williams, I'm here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, I have been a fatherhood practitioner for the past couple decades, and for the past three years, uh, I've been a certified lactation counselor. Um, you know, as a, as a father, I have a son, uh, he's 27 year old, he's my only child. He was raised in a co-parenting relationship uh, with his mom. His mom and I broke up when he was about one, um, but gratefully we were able to, to forge a team. It wasn't perfect, uh, it was tough sometimes, but we were able to stay together as a team. And I always mention that because I see the impact on my son of our ability to do that at, at 27 years old now. So he's a beautiful man out in the world. Um, I have uh, become a passionate advocate for uh, protecting, promoting, and supporting breastfeeding. And then of course, through my learning, learning more about how to carry that same uh, energy into the broader maternal child health field. So just grateful to be here, looking forward to sharing the things I'm thinking about uh, and and uh, some of the things in my life that add up to where I am today. Thank you, Reed. Hey, everybody. My name is Reed Milner. Um, I uh, I'm here in the Atlanta, Georgia area. I'm actually about an hour outside of Atlanta, um, in the middle of nowhere. I like to say I grew up on a farm out here, and so I'm very happy to be. Uh, close to home. I did go to Emory. Uh, that's how uh, Wesley and I got to know each other, graduated in 2012. Um, my wife and I, uh, we've been married for a little over seven years now. We have two uh, young sons, one six-year-old and a three-year-old, both boys. Um, so we, over the last few years, uh, it's funny, I would say that I, I feel like I know everything there is to know about uh, boys up to age six. Uh, every everything past that, I have no idea what I'm doing, and we're you know I'm I'm trying my best to uh, raise them in a way that uh, that would allow them to grow into the men that I know that they can be. Uh, trying to uh, support my wife and and everything that she does, and and she really is kind of the rock of the family, and so I've I've always tried to uh, to provide her with just that that support as a husband because she seems to just always know what she's doing right I think maybe it's a it's a it's a thing that mothers have when they have their their children and so uh, that's that's my interest uh, here as a dad and and uh, to play the role that that I ought to play uh, as their father and so uh, so yeah I'm grateful to be here uh, excited to be talking to you guys thank you brother Charles Hello, everyone. My name is uh, Dr. Charles Daniels, Jr. I am in Boston, Massachusetts, and I am the co-founder of my lovely wife of Fathers Uplift Incorporated, the country's first outpatient mental health and substance use treatment facility for fathers and their families. And we are both therapists. So we use the mental health model to work with um, men of color and their families and helping them stay engaged in their kids' lives and overcome any barriers. And typically the barriers that we deal with are emotional related, shame, guilt, embarrassment. There's a lot of fear when it comes to fatherhood and we help them overcome those things through our loving and warm environment. And we have a team of individuals that serve by our side who we're privileged to serve with and we just love them. We love our dads back to life and we love those kids who grow up in households without their fathers back to life. Um, that's our mission. Um, personally, I am the father of two. Uh, my daughter, Samaya Grace Daniels, was born during COVID. So now I'm a girl dad, so I'm still trying to understand how to deal with girls at this particular point. 
but I can tell you she's spoiled already and I love her to death. And I have a six-year-old son, Clayton Charles Daniels, who's getting ready to go to school tomorrow. So we're looking forward to that. He's not happy, but we're happy. And he gets to catch the bus for the first time. So we're also excited about that. I'm glad to be here and contribute to this dialogue with these amazing individuals. Uh, thank you for having me today. Thank you, brothers. Uh, so Calvin, I uh, understand you have a PowerPoint. You wanna get us centered with that, and then we'll go into some Q and A's. And also to the audience, if you do have any questions, any comments, please post them. Um, and we'll try to answer some of these questions during the session, but we will leave time at the end for questions as well. All right. So yeah, I'll just cue that up real quick here. Um, So uh, uh, here is Wesley giving all of us greetings from Cincinnati. Uh, Wesley, our executive director of Reaching Our Brothers Everywhere, is with Kevin Sherman, another one of our charter members of the Reaching Our Brothers Everywhere Wisdom Council during uh, one of their visits to the great city of Cincinnati. So just want to introduce you to Cincinnati, Ohio, for those who have not been here, uh, the Queen City. And uh, you'll hear uh, a little bit about Kevin Sherman here in, in a minute in my brief uh, slide presentation. So uh, I want to give you a quick introduction to Lucian families. You know, this is what's in our hearts. Um, this is this is the thing that keeps us uh, keeps us going every day, uh, trying to improve systems, organizations, and programs that affect the lives of people and families. And there's some of the things that we do um, with that heart and with that passion. Um, you know, we're, we're very, very uh, focused on maternal child health and breastfeeding as an overlay to everything we do here with families. And I invite you to check out our media page. We've got, uh, we've got some videos up there about co-parenting fathers, Black fathers supporting breastfeeding, and Kevin Sherman's second annual Father's Baby Shower this past June in New Orleans. So, all right. So, we want and need more men to be maternal child health and breastfeeding champions. I think that goes without saying. Um, we, but you know, with, with saying that though, we do want to honor the men who are right, the men who, for a variety of reasons and from a, a number of different paths, arrive at this place where they understand the need, uh, the power, uh, and the potential for when they're supporting the women in their family but also more broadly supporting maternal child health and breastfeeding in the community. That's where uh, I'm interested in uh, men being more engaged in that community space, out loud, personal, uh, and, and uh, 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 operate from passion with, uh, with what, need, what they can do for women uh, in maternal child health and breastfeeding spaces. So we need them to be champions. And I know Muhammad Ali has a saying, he said that champions must have the will and the skill, but the will must be stronger than the skill. And that takes me to uh, myself as a man who's uh, uh, in the breastfeeding maternal child health space, the will, right? So for 55 and a half years of my life, I had no will, no knowledge, no interest, no experience, in breastfeeding or matters related to maternal child health. That's just the way it was. Until the sixth annual Reaching Our Sisters Everywhere Summit in New Orleans, where I spent three days with over 400 women, doctors, researchers, IBCLCs, CLCs, peer supporters, women from every walk of life, from every ethnic and cultural group. And those three days changed me. They ignited something in me so the question I have for myself, because I've been on this passion ride ever since uh, that, that summit uh, around getting men to uh, be more present and be more vocal and be more supportive in the breastfeeding uh, arena, specifically but in maternal child health overall. So the question for me was, where was this, right? For 55 and a half years, I got nothing, right? Um, what I thought about, in New Orleans at that time uh, with the support of some amazing uh, women that helped me uh, in this conversation with myself essentially, was that I thought maybe it goes to my mother. Um, I have no relationship with my mother. She, 
when I was born, I had my mother there from birth till I was 21 years old. Um, but my father was clearly hands down my core attachment figure, my primary parental attachment figure, and remains that to this day, right? And even to this day, I can't feel my mother, right? So I don't, I know I was born into some difficulty, but I don't know what happened, right? So I don't have anything to unpack and there's nobody to ask and those type of things. That was 1959 when I was born. Um, but the question for me became, so this will that I now have, uh, to be a champion for breastfeeding and maternal child health. Is it something that was innate, but dormant? Was it absent and was it installed at that uh, summit? I mean, cause it was a powerful experience, man. I was deeply moved uh, uh, into the work in the space I am today. So, so I asked that question about myself and then I think about other men, right? Um, is it innate for all men? To, to be champions and supporters, protectors, promoters uh, of breastfeeding? Um, or is it something that needs to be installed in them? Well, I believe in men. Uh, I believe in men a lot. And so I'm going to say that I believe that it is innate. It is in the hearts of men to step into promoting, protecting, and supporting breastfeeding and supporting moms uh, in maternal child health. So I believe it is so. And it has to be, I'm going to, I'm going to assume like for me, it has to be ignited. So it's innate, it has to be ignited. And then we follow up with the skill. And that's what Reaching Our Brothers Everywhere, my company, Lucian Families, what Charles is doing, what Reed is doing. That's where we do the education, the equipping, and the empowering of men to do these things that, that, that we need. The other thing I think about this will and skill combination uh, when it comes to men uh, protecting, promoting, supporting breastfeeding um, is that th it's something that can improve their lives, right? I have a belief that um, a father, a man, a partner supporting breastfeeding, I believe that there are opportunities in that experience for men to regain, recapture some of that humanity, that humanness that for not all men, but for, for a lot of men in our society gets lost early in boyhood, right? So when we're boys, Again, not all men. There are, there are a lot of men who, who are egalitarian and have, have beautiful mindsets around these topics and issues. But still, the truth is for a lot of men at an early age, we start to uh, disconnect from the female, disconnect from women, right? So women become the other, the competition, right? Something to not be like, right? And that message is subtle and insidious and it happens to boys of, of every walk of life, right? And so I believe that men operating in these spaces that we are in and love and have passion for, I believe there is something in it for men. And one of the things that I, I, I encourage us to do is to figure out that what's in it for men, right? And aim at that, right? We need to message what we need and want from men in these spaces and then figure out the what's in it for them. I have a, uh, an idea that I'm working on around uh, breastfeeding uh, uh, men who are supporting their, their partners in breastfeeding uh, to help them uh, realize what's possible for themselves through this through the process, right? Between their relationship with the mother of their child and as importantly, their relationship with their selves. So um, for me, that will was nowhere in sight for five and a half decades. And now, you know, I'm just steeped in it. And I believe that can be so for, for more men in our communities. Um, but we have to do some inviting. We have to do some investigating too, which is, which is a, a big part of what we do at Lucian Families. And I know um, Reaching Our Brothers Everywhere is seeking a grant to do just that, to do survey-based research, multi-site survey-based research on thoughts, attitudes, and beliefs of men. Um, so we need to do some investing and some investigating and then helping men understand what's in it for them. And trust me, the what's in it for them is what's in it for their uh, families and their children. Well, some other things I've been thinking about um, is uh, biosexual functions between men and women and looking at what this, what this load looks like. So we, uh, men achieve sexual maturity. Uh, the correlation there is for women to uh, 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 arrive at menstruation. Uh, men 
begin intercourse, women, of course. Then there's this divergence where the load shifts. So women are uh, uh, managing and, and, and exploring and experiencing the pregnancy, labor and delivery, breastfeeding, and then care and providing with all of that. Right? So you see this imbalance. And, and one of the things I think about is how can we get this balance right again for men's sake, right? And for the sake of their, their families and children. Well, one is for men to invest in maternal child health. And what do I mean by that? I mean, we need to help men uh, become students. We need to <clears throat> help men become curious about the issues in maternal child health. And I'll tell you, it starts really with understanding, becoming more uh, educated about women's bodies, right? What, what happens with women? Because the more I learn, the more amazed I am about this, this cycle of life and the role that women play in it. So we want men to invest in maternal child health. And I'll tell you what that looks like for me. Uh, one, one piece, right? I'm all over the place. But when I think about this, I think about my relationship with all moms empowered to nurse here in Cincinnati, Ohio. Now, I've been a part of that group on, you know, I would attend the meetings there every Friday. I attend as much as I can. Some periods I'm not able to attend, to attend at all. But I always get the invitation. And so I attend and, and I, I turn my mic off, my camera off, sit back. Because as a CLC, when I, when I got my certification, I realized my number one job is to keep learning, right? Not, not to run, run around here talking about I'm a CLC. I need to keep my mouth shut and keep learning, right? So with All Moms Empowered to Nurse, that's what I do. That's one of the many spaces that I do that in. And I didn't know it until a few weeks ago uh, when they asked me to put together a, uh, a workshop for the men in the lives of the women in All Moms Empowered to Nurse. And I was told that the, the women in Amen is the name of the group. They wanted to make sure that the workshop was separate. The moms don't like their space violated or invaded by men. It's a safe and sacred space for them. And it hit me that I'm in that space routinely, right? They invite me into that space. And so it really hit me deeply, the honor that, that I'm given to be able to show up in these women's space to talk about breastfeeding and support breastfeeding. So that's one example of how I invest others is I, I'm constantly on the lookout for how I can learn more. So investing in maternal child health, that's what it looks like for me. And that's uh, an idea that I think we can, we can uh, have men do as well. Uh, breastfeeding support goes without saying, uh, when men are involved in the decision to breastfeed, the initiation, the duration, uh, things tend to go better. Uh, breastfeeding, breastfeeding moms are two and a half times to breastfeed exclusively at six months when their partner is supportive of the breastfeeding effort. So that's another area. And then we go into some spaces where there's a lot of good research coming out that's out and, and continues to come out on men and domestic work, unpaid care work. Sorry. Domestic work and unpaid care work. Um, Promundo and uh, the Lever Corporation have a report, I think it was 2018, that showed the benefits to men when they increase their share of domestic work and unpaid care work. And quite naturally, the benefits to women and mothers when that happens, which means a total uh, net benefit for the family. So I'm gonna show you how I really feel about this stuff and then I'm good to go. Beautiful, powerful, wonderful, passionate, skilled, professional, loving, compassionate, caring women. And so, as my t-shirt says, breastfeeding is a team sport. Thanks to all those dads out there who do support breastfeeding. Thanks to all those dads out there who are thinking about it. Thanks to all those dads out there who don't know anything about dad supporting breastfeeding because we're coming for you. <laughs> Woo! Woo Thank awesome. you. Thank you for that, Brother Calvin. Uh, Reed, would you like to either uh, discuss anything you heard in that presentation, or if you could tell us a little bit about your fatherhood journey? And you talked about knowing things, um, you know, for a six-year-old and you have a three-year-old, talk about, you know, the differences in their birthing experience, if you don't mind sharing. Yeah, of course. And, and Calvin, thank you for that presentation. That was, uh, I, I know I've already learned a lot on this. Um, and so 
yeah. So just talk about my experience a little bit. Um, so my wife and I were, were pretty young when we got married, uh, especially, you know, relative to, we'll say a lot of our friend group, a lot of the folks I went to college with, we were 24, I think my wife was 23 and, uh, we had our first child really soon after that. He was born about a month before our first year anniversary. So, um, uh, we were, we were doing that. We were learning how to be married to one another which both of those are skills, right? And that you have to figure out through trial and error. And I also started a business at the same time. And we went through a, uh, a family tragedy. My, my father-in-law was killed in a uh, car accident by a drunk driver. So we had, we had all of these things that were happening to us uh, at once. And then somebody hands you a baby, right? In the middle of it. And so my wife was, um, you know, she was doing, again, what I've been so amazed by the entire time is that she's been uh, almost naturally uh, knowing what to do, just taking care of this child. And I've been in my, in, in my body. And by the way, I have no medical background, no, no, no training like, like Calvin has, or, uh, and, and I was not, I didn't have these, these great resources at my disposal at the time. So on the outside, I kept telling myself just look like you know what you're doing and be supportive. And on the inside, it was just like, if you can imagine somebody running around a room, like with their hair on fire, like that was what was happening for me on the inside. Um, but, you know, we, we, I, I think through a lot of love and, and patience, we really figured a lot of things out on the fly. And, and today I still, I still, I own a marketing agency. That's my full-time job. And it's, it's an odd situation, right? Like, like it's not the type of environment that I think a lot of us perhaps remember when we grew up where, where if you had, you know, mother and father in the household, maybe dad got up and, and went to work and, and left for, for the day. Um, I work primarily out of a home office, but I'm all over the place. Um, some days I'll be in this part of town or this, this state, or I'll have calls at 9 p.m. at night or uh, 5 a.m. in the morning because we've got some international clients um, and and we're trying to and so so with that trade-off I, I I make some or, or with, with that uniqueness I make a lot of these trade-offs so I have the great fortune of being able to to you know take my boys to school some mornings and um, pick them up from school and I coach their football team and things like that so we have a unique experience um, that we that we try to take as as much advantage of as we can and try to enjoy that as much as we can um, to speak on the different experiences we had with our oldest son and our youngest son so I gave that background for our our first child second child comes along uh, and we we were having another boy so we thought we 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 got this we we went through the the boot camp that was, having a child in the middle of all of that stuff, uh, we got this, it's another boy. He's gonna be exactly like his older brother. Um, the only thing that they have in common is, is we could pass down some clothes from one to the other. These boys could not have been more different. Um, and, and their life experiences, as you all can imagine, have been very, very different. Because I don't know if you guys watched the news, but about 18 months ago or so, there was this global pandemic that that hit and it, it caused a little bit of disruption in, in people's lives. So my youngest son, who was about 18 months old himself at the time, he's been raised in this very different environment. And so uh, my my wife and I, just in trying to, to navigate this, we've just said, look, if there's going to be one thing that we're going to have to have with one another, it's going to have to be a lot of patience, which thankfully those experiences that we had early in our marriage and early in our uh, parenthood uh, was, was the skill that was most tested and most required. So everything through, um, you know, their early days and, and both my boys also had very different, um, they, they had very different, you know, uh, we'll say just uh, uh, growth and development when it comes to feeding and uh, my wife breastfed with one of the children and it, and it, it just wasn't, it wasn't something that worked well for the other one. Right. So we, um, we, we did things differently with the other one. And I felt like my job was again, to, to support her in that. So we've just had so many of these, uh, these very different experiences that I would say, you know, the, the, the patience, the, the patience muscle has been, 
uh, the thing that we both have, have flexed the most. And, and again, I, I wish I could bring her in here and just kind of put, put her in front of me as the expert, uh, cause she's done such a great job. Um, but yeah, that's been my experience and, and we're, we're, again, we're, we're still figuring this stuff out. My son will be, uh, starting, uh, school. My youngest son will be starting school next week. Uh, he'll be going to school with his older brother. Um, and so my wife and I'll be moving into a new phase of, of how we parent our children. She's going to be working with me in the business. It's something that we both, uh, wanted for, for her for a while, um, and so it's we're, we're going to figure out a different routine, right, and a different way of, of parenting uh, these boys and and making sure to nurture our relationship. Because if I can speak on that, you know, briefly, I know that everybody, I'm sure everybody has very different parenting styles and very different relationships with their spouse or the, the mother and father of their children. But I know that for us, we feel like if we can if we can prioritize and we can keep our relationship healthy that has always benefited our boys. That's just, that's just what has worked well for us. And we've tested that over and over again. And if she and I are on the same page and we are working well together and she feels supported and I feel supported and we both feel, feel loved, we can just be there and be able to, uh, to do what we need to do for, for our, for our sons. And so that's been, that's been my experience. Hopefully that's helpful. Um, uh, that's just, that's just my kind of raw, experience uh recollect yep. that's very helpful thank you uh some of this with this panel we want to hear different stories and hear true experiences so for you to share that with us was absolutely helpful and we'll come back around and learn some more from you soon uh dr daniels um if you could share us you know, whatever you would like to respond either from calvin's presentation or uh, what brother reed was mentioning or if you could also address some of the barriers that you've seen, um, especially you talked about having a child during COVID. I know there are a lot of uh, hospital mandates about who could be in the room and who couldn't and how that affected your support um, during that time. Absolutely. You know, um, I really appreciated what Calvin and Reed were saying. I'm glad to contribute um, to this conversation. Um, I can tell you, speaking on the breastfeeding journey and being a African-American male and his journey to becoming a father has been one that's been extremely um, difficult and challenging. I grew up in a household without my father, right? And my father was not absent because he didn't love me. He was absent because he had a wife and family that he was tending to. And my mother was the outside woman. So think about my mother bringing me into this world by herself. She did not have my father there to be by her side, but she did have a caring community of brothers and sisters. She had my grandmother who poured into her. She had her church community that would cook meals and send meals to the hospital when my grandmother could not make it from Florida to Georgia to aid her, right? She had that caring community of individuals. Fast forward, when my children were born, Clayton, prior to COVID-19, and my wife, and my son and my daughter during COVID-19, you know, I could not be what I didn't have. You know, so I remember this moment vividly when my son was born, Clayton, and my wife was breastfeeding him. And I was in the living room of our basement apartment at the time, and she had her pump. And I can tell it was extremely difficult for her and emotionally overwhelming now that I look back. And I was very inconsiderate. I remember what I said to my wife. I said, I said, babe, you better pump that milk. My baby need those minerals. She need those nutrients. He need, listen, I need you to do this. I know it hurts, but you got to toughen up. You got to get it done. And my wife looked at me and she said, you get over here and you pump. And I was like, okay. You know, there was a reaction, um, a response to me not knowing how to show up and be fully present for her in that moment. And now that I look back at it, when you think about it, you know, research clearly shows, studies have recently shown that Black and Native women in the United States of America experience maternal care as largely disrespectful and stressful due to racism, right? I mean, we have to add that as a barrier in the room. And I found myself, when I look back at that moment, is somehow mirroring the environment that contributes to my wife's difficult experience as a Black woman breastfeeding and navigating a healthcare system that is unfair. And I look back and I'm like, wow, I don't want to be a part of the issue. I actually want to be a part of the solution. 
You know, when you think about just the roots of what it is that Black and Native women experience in America, I mean, the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists said it recently. They said recognizing race is a social construct, not biologically based, is important to understanding that racism, not race, impacts health care and health and health outcomes, especially for women of color. Right. So when we think about it from that lens, you know, and we think about what men have to experience in those health care systems. And we think about the short end of the stick that our women typically get when they're experiencing pregnancy or breastfeeding in the hospital. It's, it's easy for a black woman and native woman to be introduced milk as opposed to receiving assistance to breastfeed. Right. You know, typically we find providers bringing out the Similac prior to spending more time more time to walk them through the breastfeeding process. And that's an inequity. And it's, and it's actually connected to the, the racism, the systemic oppression that many of, that's embedded in the healthcare system that we, we have to acknowledge. And I can tell you that earlier this year in Massachusetts, the legislature passed H48118, an act to reduce racial disparities in maternal health by establishing a commission to make policy recommendations to eliminate maternal inequities but more policy and work is needed. And the governor Baker really led this charge and I was invited to be a part of that commission. And when I look at the work full circle and I'm hearing the stories of mothers who have lost their children and the struggles that they have had in hospitals because of the color of their skin and not receiving adequate care, it made me reflect back to how I was navigating alongside my wife um, during COVID-19, but also prior to COVID-19. And I can tell you the sensitivity that I had and the affection that I had when my daughter was born as my wife was attempting to breastfeed was more supportive to her as a Black woman, right? It was more loving. Um, I, can, I can tell you that she breastfed my daughter longer than she actually breastfed my son due to the stress and not necessarily having that support that she deserved, right? So when I think about the role of men in this process and the role of providers in this process, first and foremost, the role of men in this process to understand any trauma, racism effects that they've experienced, also their struggles with their own healthcare system. You know, how can we encourage involvement in the healthcare system when many men of color don't typically engage in healthcare? A recent study came out with the American Heart Association that talked about how men of color are typically uh, more likely to have higher stages of cancer um, than their white counterparts because they do not go to the doctor often, as often as they need. And typically cancer goes undetected because they're not constantly screening the way in which they should. So we don't hardly go to the doctor until we feel something that's going on. I think men in general have that experience, but men of color especially have that experience. Why is that? When we look at the history of the Tuskegee experience, we have history. We don't act for no apparent reason, right? There's always a reason and historical foundation to what's going on. But during COVID-19 and having a child in that process, um, to speak a little bit more about Wesley was asking me, um, as a father with resources and connections, um, I was almost a parking lot dad. Right. I've had several experiences and interactions with my wife as she was going through her OBGYN appointments in the parking lot. And I was almost one of those dads who had to see their daughter born or their child born via phone. But we were not having that. And we advocated to make sure that I was able to be in that hospital. But think about many of the men who were not able to be in the hospital this past year who stayed in the parking lot right, due to the lack of resources or not being able to advocate for themselves. And also think about the men who many providers may not have seen at the wellness visits, but wanted to be engaged, but they could not due to some of the barriers that we see, um, depression, anxiety, fear, um, shame, um, afraid that they're gonna be the same way that, to their child that their father was to them. These are real barriers that don't meet the eye. Right. Typically, what meets the eye is that these men may not be present at the wellness visits or in or at the birth of their children. But what doesn't meet the eye is the emotional discomfort. And, you know, during the birth of our first child, I know I'm jumping around. My wife and I almost divorced because it was extremely stressful. You're thinking about a man who has had degrees. You think about a man who had a business. And at that particular stage of my life, becoming a dad was still extremely stressful. So as we talk about maternal health and we talk about 
its effects on black and brown women. I think it's also to create room for men to be allies in the process, as Calvin was saying earlier, because many of us care, even though it may not appear that we care for those that may not be present physically. How can you partner with us in teaching us what to do and how to be in alignment with our partners? I think there's a lot of educational opportunities here, and I'm looking forward to continuing the dialogue. Thank you, Wesley. Awesome. Thank you very much for that. And you mentioned uh, policy, uh, policy change. Uh, Calvin, if you could share a little bit about Ohio and how they're different in their fatherhood work on a public level uh, from a government funding stage. And then Reed, you and I, we talked about maternity and paternity leave. If you could give us some thoughts. Um, and this is for the panel. At this point, it's a panel discussion. But just thinking about like successes and thinking about ways that we can change and others can contribute to a positive change. Uh, towards men, toward, towards the maternal and infant health space. But um, Brother Calvin, if you share some about Ohio. Sure, glad to, Wesley. Ohio, uh, I'm, I'm unabashedly proud of Ohio's fatherhood infrastructure. So we are one of the four states in the nation that have a commission on fatherhood. And one of three of those four where the commission is enshrined, encoded into law. So it must exist, it must be funded, it must be populated. It has a charge to work with all state agencies uh, looking for opportunities to increase engagement, service, and supports to fathers. That's from child welfare to children's services to workforce across the board. Uh, it's led by an incredible woman, Kimberly Dent. I always bring that up specifically because sometimes I get asked, well, actually often I get asked, can women do fatherhood work? And I love bringing up Kim because she is, she is rocking the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. Um, so with that commission, we're able to, through all the state agencies, through all the counties, uh, we're able to implement policy ideas. We're able to advocate for certain uh, uh, family uh, policies within other state agencies and department. We're able to leverage the, uh, the relationships and the position we have with state government to work with foundations, with businesses at a state level. Another important part of the commission is their focus on infant mortality and breastfeeding. So in the past six years, the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood has made it a point that their local grantees, there are about, uh, I think there's about 35 grantees around the state of Ohio that um, are, are, are encouraged to use um, uh, curricula that, that does help teach fathers about uh, breastfeeding, the importance of it. And more recently, um, they are asking fatherhood programs to put a focus on infant mortality. So, um, so the commission is one part of our structure. The other part is the Ohio Practitioners Network for Fathers and Families, or OPNFF, which I'm proud to say I'm a charter member. Uh, 18 years ago, the Ohio Practitioners Network was set up with just myself and a couple other guys in a restaurant just saying, hey, let's pull some people together and, and have a statewide network modeled after the National Practitioners Network for Fathers and Families, which I'm not sure is still operating, but back then they were a model for how states could organize themselves with regards to volunteers, uh, not state agency and state personnel, but volunteers coming together and using that framework to advance fatherhood in a different uh, way uh, than the commission. So between those two bodies, we we're really, really strong uh, in that. And, you know, even down to the county level. So the commission funds, uh, does seed grants for every county in Ohio. Their goal is that all 87 counties in Ohio will have a fatherhood initiative of their own design funded and supported by the Ohio Commission on Fatherhood. So lots of avenues to engage men and fathers, lots of ways to get the messages about breastfeeding, infant mortality, and other maternal child health issues out to the community, to the ears of men. A lot of work to do, but I'm really, really proud of where we are. Awesome. Reed, if you could um, share a little bit about maternal and uh, maternal paternal leave, your thoughts about it just, you know, as a father and how you think it would be different, you know, for us in a different age. So you did also talk about your work and how you're not at a factory or you're not at a site in particular every day. If you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. And, and mine is, you know, my thoughts, I'll, I'll give my experience and then, you know, I would almost put it out there as like an open 
problem to be solved, right? I don't know that I have the solution to this, but but one experience, it, I would say it's a relatively unique experience. I think it's actually less unique in this, especially post-COVID economy, we'll say where so many people are relying on, at the very least, some self-employed income to support themselves or their families. Uh, but but there was no there was no opportunity or no option for any kind of paternity leave or support given what I do I I'm the I own the business and at the time of my first son, good lord I think we were we were bringing in a gross revenue of maybe you know three thousand dollars a month or something like that I mean it was very very early stages of the business and um, and so I was working you know, in the delivery room, you know, up until right before and and maybe after things had settled down. And then with my second son, uh, it was it was actually a pretty similar situation. Um, I was because we went into the hospital. We actually went in the hospital uh, about eight weeks prior to the due date. Uh, my wife was having some um, early si or signs of early labor. So we had to go in for a couple of nights uh, and and she was treated for that. Um, luckily, that 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 did not end up. She, the, my son did not end up being born at that time. They gave her some uh, treatment, and we were able to go home. We were there for two two days, and she was in a great deal of pain and discomfort. And I was saying, um, "Yeah, babe, I'm 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 here for you. Um, I just need to answer this email like real quick, because and, and it wasn't a matter of like um, you know uh, of me placing a value on." Uh, as hard as it is to to now say that and how that imagine how you know one feels in the moment, it was a almost a matter of survival because uh, there was no there was nobody then to take my place, uh, and it wasn't just a matter of replacing uh, you know lost income for a period of time. It was if I don't produce, uh, we lose that business. We potentially are not able to to fulfill on a project, and that future income. Uh, or that that client could be lost, right? Could be gone, right? So there's a there's a it's a very complex situation. I think when you're in that and you're when when you have that sort of employment uh, scenario, or you're a business owner. Um, today it would probably be different. Admittedly, today um, we have we built a a an infrastructure in the business where if I had to go away for a week, we have we have people in place that can step in and make sure that things continue to move forward. Uh, again, at the time, that just wasn't present. Now, one thing we had, which which you know was a tremendous blessing, we had my wife's mother, we had my parents, uh, who were able to come in and provide that that support, even if only an emotional support. I mean, definitely more than just emotional support. My oldest son, when we were going to deliver my youngest son, uh, we didn't have to worry about how he was going to be taken care of. Right? We had a plan in place ahead of time that when my wife went into labor, we were gonna drop off or, or we were actually going to, at the time we lived uh, with my, my mother-in-law whose husband passed away, we, we lived with her for a, a little while to, to help her through that period. So my oldest son stayed there. My parents came and pick him, picked him up, kept him for a couple of days until we were ready for them to bring my son to the hospital. So we just had this, fantastic support system that that if that were not available i do not know well i guess we would have had my son in the hospital with us right you know he would have been a part of that that delivery I could have process met you halfway. I, I, yeah yeah i, I would have called wes you would have been my best uh, <laughs> next best option <laughs> but i mean it, there there is there is very definitely i think an opportunity for a a solution here potentially. Uh, I'm not sure what that looks like, and I'm not sure what the what the proper role of government or or private or nonprofit organizations uh, is. You know that that there would be there would be part of that solution. Um, but I I can imagine others in that situation that I was in without that just blessing of a familial support system to be able to to help uh, it would have been it would have been very difficult it, it would have been very difficult to either one one would have to make a choice right do i do i am i going to be present for this experience with my wife and and with my child as they're born or do i have to put you know put put in the the the, the work to make sure that when we get home we can put food on the table it's a difficult choice to to make and luckily i was able to make it without losing either one 
Um, but I'm well aware that that was a, you know, that, that, that that's not, and it's just th those resources that I had are just not available to each and every person who goes through that. So uh, again, I just kind of put that out there as an open thought for discussion and feedback, really. Awesome. That's great. Um, yeah, definitely feel free, uh, Calvin, Brother Daniels, to discuss that point next time you unmute. But to Brother Charles, I would like to ask um, if you could share some of the traumas that are common in your community or that you research and hear about. And could you also discuss um, what equity and diversity mean to you? and how on a broader scale, like Reed was saying, different models of support and different ways people can receive support, but how can we either standardize it, uh, you know, discuss some best practices with us if you could. Absolutely, absolutely. So, you know, in terms of the trauma, some of the traumas that we've been exposed to in our community and some that I've heard um, during our work with the Maternity Health Commission for the entire state, um, when, of course, when mothers lose their children, that's definitely your trauma. Um, but imagine losing your child and being sent um, to the normal side of the hospital. Typically, when you lose a child, they keep you in the unit to care for you, to allow you to grieve. But for many of the mothers of color that we've spoken to, that's not the case for them. They send them back to an area of the hospital that's typically where individuals who have birthed their children, their children are healthy, are because they don't have the space. So can you imagine losing your child and being surrounded by other mothers that just had their children? Yes, that has happened. And mothers have definitely been traumatized by that. For fathers, losing a child is definitely traumatizing. Um, specifically, not having your father in your life is a considered a form of trauma, right? And fear. Imagine um, many fathers who have grown up in households without their fathers are consistently wrestling with the father that they want to be and being afraid of emulating the father that they didn't have, right? So it becomes very overwhelming, but also traumatic. Um, I think another form of trauma um, that we see in Massachusetts is dealing with, you know, having your child taken uh, by a police officer. I know it may not necessarily be connected to maternal um, health. Nonetheless, um, that's definitely a popular form of trauma that we are dealing with nationally, but also in the state of Massachusetts. That's definitely a focus that we see um, at our agency, but also on the Maternal Health Commission. Um, I think now we are hearing a lot of mothers and fathers being afraid to have children, particularly black and brown fathers, being afraid to bring children into um, the world, given what's currently going on. So that's just, just an example of the effects of trauma, right? Being afraid to bring children, particularly our mothers, being afraid to bring children to the world because of how they would be treated by hospital staff. You know, um, I know particularly specifically, you know, this trauma resonated with my wife and I. My wife doesn't want to have more children, given the complexities that she has had with our previous two births and also the treatment that she's had, that she, he, she has had um, with, the, with the hospital. But we are so thankful for her OBGYN, who was very good and advocated for her. But she had that consistent source of support. Um, who delivered both of our children to advocate for her despite the treatment that she would receive um, by hospitals. We're also hearing a recent study that I conducted that's currently being vetted by journals is that many uh, Black and African-American mothers that I've interviewed um, have really been taken aback when the providers have assumed that the fathers were not in the child's life because they were at the hospital visit by themselves. They considered that disrespectful and they were treated as if they were a single mother. And typically what we see how mothers are treated in the state of Massachusetts, when they're treated like a single mother, right? There's no questions that are being asked about the father. There's no phone calls that's being asked by the father. Typically, the mother has to remind the provider that the father exists and the father wants to be involved um, in the delivery of their child and in this process. Uh, like having to force the doctor to pay attention to their partner. We find a lot of our African-American and Black mothers doing that through the birthing process. In terms of solutions, right, and what we have seen that's work, you know, I really love what Calvin is doing um, in Ohio with the Fatherhood Commission. Um, I also would definitely um, encourage the creation of a racial inequities and maternal health commission in every state. I know now they're starting to address racism and maternal health. 
nationwide, but I'm not sure how many commissions actually exist where that's all they're doing is tackling maternal health disparities among African-American women and black women, brown women, right? I think focusing exclusively on that population because the way they're treated is different. If we were to be honest and be fully transparent and we have to acknowledge that. Um, those are solutions that I would definitely strongly encourage. Thank you, Wesley. Thank Wesley, you. Can I, can I comment on some things Charles said? Uh, Charles, man, I'm getting inspired sitting up here uh, listening to you. You hit the nail on the head with the uh, uh, black women in hospitals and clinics being seen as single, man. It is so pervasive. Um, it, it, it is actually traumatic in itself. And here's how that trauma plays out on the father's side. So I've, I've got a, uh, I'm working on a video series about uh, black men in maternal child health spaces. And I got an interview with a dad. And the, the, the thing that he said to me was jarring. He said, it's one thing to be unheard but it's a whole different level of hurt to be unseen, right? That's what that's what we're going through here in, in these spaces. And so, so you're absolutely right to, to point that out as trauma. And the other thing that you said about uh, men not going to the doctor, to me, that's an example of that disconnect that starts in boyhood, where I, I have to disconnect from my true and natural self in order to be a quote unquote man. So. Just, just really fired up about what you're talking about. And yes, a, a maternal child health commission, I'm on it. Awesome. And I'm looking at the questions. We have some great questions on the app. So I'm going through those, uh, but we're gonna do one more quick round and uh, then get to some of these questions. So uh, Reed, if you could share with us um, how you think this community could contribute to you or to your family's growth or to the growth of your community. So how can the field of maternal infant health, fatherhood, and some of the discussions that you've heard today with equity, with um, working with healthcare industries, finding resources and support support for people, what are some specific asks that you would ask if you had the CEO of a big hospital or big pharma or someone else um, that could give you what you needed? Yeah, I mean, I think, it, it, it as leading up to and then you know shortly after um, ha having a child, delivering a child, um, some resources that would be super helpful uh, would be some education. I think is is going to be it's going to be hard to say that that wouldn't be helpful. I know for me personally, um, you know when we were handed this child and they say good luck, we'll see you know let us know if you have any problems. Call call the number nine one one. Um, you know, it was just, it, it didn't, it didn't, it was not that they weren't helpful. Uh, they were great. They're, they're fantastic, you know, nurses and, and doctors that were there that helped us, but just some of that support to say, Hey, look, you know, mom, here's, here's how you do this. And, and they were, they did provide a lactation consultant to my wife. Um, and again, I feel bad that I'm complaining. They did, they were more than helpful. Uh, but it, I do think something, some some resource or some person to say, hey, okay, dad, here's what you can do, right? Here's what we need you to do to support your wife. I think the best thing I did was just, you know, sh sh just give her some supportive words from across the room. Um, and I and I would have liked to have been able to do more uh, to to just provide that actual support to make make things easier with our second child. It was keep the oldest out of the room while my wife was pumping or something like that. That was that was the best that I felt like I could do. And um, and Dr. Charles, you said something earlier, and I'm I was I was guilty of the the, the sin that you committed in your with your first child. Um, I probably pushed a little bit, thinking that that was being supportive because that's how men support each other, right? That's how we push each other. That's how I pushed Wes when we were on the basketball team together. It was come on, man, like let's. Let's you know get get there faster, work harder. That's not super helpful to a woman who's uh, who's slept for approximately three minutes in the last forty eight hours and is trying to provide nourishment for a child. So some of that support from an education standpoint to be able to say, okay, here, Dad, here's what you need to do. Here's what you can be. Uh, here's what you can do to be most helpful. And then again, so perhaps a a private public collaborative solution on providing that that paternity support. Uh, I don't know what that would look like. It's probably, as Wes, you and I talked about the other day, 
it's probably more complicated than something like the PPP program that came out as a part of the, the COVID response, so the stimulus response um, to make sure that that fathers and mothers are able to to take that time and, and adjust to life with a child after you've had, especially if you're going from zero to one, that's a big gap. That's a big jump from having no children to one child, life changes. Um, but then it's no much, no, no, no more or less complex. It's just different when you go from uh, up one to, to a few or one to two or, or two to three children or, or so on and so forth. So those would be things that I can immediately think of that would be really helpful. Awesome, thank you. I hope someone's out there taking notes. I definitely am. Um, Brother Charles, uh, so looking at some of this, these questions I have over here, and this is for you, Brother Calvin, as well. The, people would like to know how men can be um, engaged in this policy work or in a task force. So what are some either you know recruitment advice you would give, some retention advice you can get? That's usually a big one. We can get men into the room, but it's hard for them to continue to want to come if you could share some of that just why are we here so the four of us are here and i'm sure there's other men on this call who you know advocate for the things we advocate for as well or are in the space but share a little bit about recruitment and um what's attractive um okay well great question great question so we had this conversation on the, on the Maternal Health Commission in Massachusetts. How do we get our men involved? Um, one thing that we had to understand is that traditionally men are not a part of these conversations. You know, so I think an aggressive, explicit invitation, you know, if we're going to say, hey, you know, come, let's come and talk about maternal health, right? But also the roles that fathers play in that process. We have to be deliberate. We have to be aggressive. We have to state, Yes, this is, fathers are invited and are welcome. We would love to hear your feedback. We would love for you to be in a room. We cannot assume that when we submit a flyer or we do a Facebook post, right, that they're gonna automatically come. I also like to lean on personal relationships, right? I think relationships are very valuable. And the people in your community who may be next door in your agency, next door to your agency, in the coffee shop down the street, if you have one near you, at the McDonald's, at the Burger King, I don't know what's in your area. I think really going into those areas and you will see fathers engaging with their children. You will see men having conversations and going up and inviting them to the table to have some of these important um, conversations. I think we have to put ourselves out there to invite them to the table to have these conversations because typically we're not invited. Um, especially men of color. I think now there's a huge transition, a huge funding wave to get more men of color involved in certain conversations because of the racial uprising that happened in our, com in, in our country. But we also have to realize that this can't be just a one-time invite. We got to create cultures. We got to create events and opportunities to continue to create a relationship with them that's sustainable. We asked them once, but what would be the return on their investment? What, are, what type of gifts are we giving? What is, how, how would they know that their time is valued? What we see um, in our state, and, we, and I, say, I see it in other states too, and we typically stray away from this practice, is when we ask fathers to come talk to us and we take their data, but we don't give them funding for their data, right? We don't give them rewards for their data. We don't say, hey, we honor you for your contribution. We don't put their name on the reports for credit. Right. These things are valuable, not only to men, but to residents who are reliving their experiences, talking to you about their trauma. I think we have to really be intentional about the rewards that they receive in return for coming to the table. But they want to come to the table. And yes, for some of us, just being at the table may be enough. But if you're talking to a father who can't afford to pay for his to get his kid a meal. Right. Don't have that conversation with him. Hey, listen, what's the return on his investment? right? He needs that, right? If you're talking to that father who is trying to get his career up and running and he has a voice, what he has to say is good to say, how can we make sure that he gets credit for his contribution? I mean, these things contribute to the uplift for our communities. And one thing that we are tired of in the state of Massachusetts is black and brown men being used for data, but not receiving a reward in return, right? I think it's, it's good to show up to the table. But it's also good to be appreciated for your contribution. Um, so I think that's very important. And once you develop a culture of appreciating them for contributing, 
they will voluntarily come to the table and contribute and they will bring other people to contribute. And we see that happening as a ripple effect that follows up where we involve our fathers in the process and we reward them for their contribution via credit, whatever the case may be. They bring other community members to us to talk to us because they understand that we value their contribution. And I think oftentimes our contribution do not feel valued. So I think how do you invite them to the table, allow them to share, but also show that you value their contribution. Those are three things I would add, Wesley. Thank you. And Brother Calvin, you're on mute and I see Ms. Yeah, Kia. Just, just, yeah, just wanna see if this is a second. So, so one, the first thing I think about often, and I actually uh, engaged a group of researchers from Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center last week about this. They said, Calvin, how can we get uh, more fathers involved in our well child visits and how can we engage fathers? And the first thing I talk about is where are you as individuals about men and fathers and fatherhood, right? So you can't engage fathers when you have some trauma or some unmet needs around fathers and fathers. That needs to be explored. If you have some uh, assumptions and prejudices about men and fathers, that needs to be explored amongst that staff. I mean, you have to have that conversation. And I encourage uh, uh, people to think about fatherhood in, in three dimensions. There's the man, the person, there's his conception or his idea of the role, and then there's his parenting behavior. So you wanna, you wanna broaden out and, and make three-dimensional you know, who and what fathers are, right? And, and so, so anyway, I'll, I'll leave it there, but I just think that's, that's part of the work too in the spaces we want fathers to be in. Are we okay with, with fathers and fatherhood? Wesley, can I say one thing? I'm sorry, Calvin just got me fired up. <laughs> <laughs> Calvin, you man, what a great point. Just real quickly, right? I think just to add to Calvin's point too, because you know, if you're not okay, or if you haven't worked through your own trauma with your father or men in your life, right? You will automatically project that onto the father that you are trying to invite to the table. And men sense things, right? They sense emotions. They know what your environment stands for before you open your mouth, right? Which goes to another point. How can your agency speak that you uh, welcome fathers before you open your mouth. I believe that every agency has a culture. Every agency has a language that they speak. And typically, before you open your mouth, that father will automatically know whether you support fathers or you don't support fathers. And lastly, it's extremely important for us to know that fathers need to be supported mentally as well. So as we have expectations while we're working through our own father stuff, we cannot project our definitions of what they should be and what they're not doing onto them. Right, we have to be neutral and we have to respect where they are as a fathers and their own definition of fatherhood. Thank you, Wes. I'm sorry. Awesome, no problem. And right before we get done, I would like to share. So I do I'm looking at some of the comments and questions in here. And there is a discussion about the vocabulary we're using or the language we're using with men and or men and women in a binary discussion. Do want to share that we are, you know, culturally sensitive and try to be as um humble and knowledgeable as possible. Um, so this discussion is based on the support that we want to give birthing people and the support that uh, birthing people need to receive, um, however you identify yourself. Um, and you know, please, we welcome you to uh, continue that dialogue and discussion with us so we can learn and grow there as well. And with that, I think we're about out of time, unless anybody wants to give a last word. I want to speak to that, Wesley. I think the fatherhood feel, um, that's a space we need to go into and find our way to be comfortable about that. I see fatherhood programs struggling with that. And, and just like uh, the, the gulf between, in some areas, fatherhood and intimate partner violence, domestic violence, we were able to bridge that gulf here in Ohio. And, and I think the same can be done with moving away from gender binary and making sure that all people are respected for their identity and the way that they chose to live their life. So that's that's an area of growth for the fatherhood field. Thank you. And everyone's contact information, I'm sure uh, MLIC has. So um, feel free to continue reaching out to all of us. So all of these are my brothers. I work and talk with them regularly and um, you know do encourage more collaboration. So something we did have as a discussion was discuss silos in collaboration and kind of have you seen that different in that growth, but we'll save that for part two at another time. 